Hello and welcome to the Home Assistant Podcast. Today we're here with Phil and Philip. How's it going, guys? Hey. This episode is sponsored by Home Assistant Cloud by Nabucasa. Easily access your home, local Home Assistant instance remotely for a small monthly fee that supports the Home Assistant and ESP Home Project. Configurations done by the user interface, so there's no fiddling with router settings, SSL certificates, or any YAML. Um, Phil, welcome to the podcast. Um, thank you for being so patient on our waiting list for so long. Where are you joining us from? I'm joining you from, from Germany, well, the western part of Germany. Um, yeah, to be precise, from Dortmund. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So how did you get started with Home Assistant, Philip? Like where was, or how, where did you start in home, home automation in general? Like how long have you been in home automation and yeah, what mm, led you to Home Assistant? I, I think my, my journey is, is not the, the usual journey. Um, mm. I think most, most of people just buy some proprietary stuff and then think about joining it all together. Um, for me, it was mm. a bit different. Um, I started with some um, open system, some open source system called FHBM, yeah. um, okay. which ran on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and I used it back then for just uh, logging temperature and humidity in, in our flat. Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the setup grew and I added some, some relays for uh, switching on and off um, outlets, stuff like that. Um, and at some point, um, something wasn't working with FHEM that was working with Home Assistant. I was looking at Home Assistant before, but, mm. um, I think it was the IKEA, uh, thread free, um, hub that wasn't working with FHEM, but was working already with Home Assistant. And yeah. then I decided, uh, I'd switch to Home Assistant. Um, and I think. In, in my email I wrote, it was like 2018, but it was more probably it was around 2017. So a couple of years, I'm already using Home Assistant. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I've got an, another instance running at my dad's house and uh, he's also pretty happy with it. Yeah. Um, and one interesting, cool. yeah, <laughs> most, most of my stuff now is uh, no, Parts of my stuff now are, are proprietary um, and lots of parts are still open source or at least uh, built by myself. So, so I get access to the source code and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. Within that transition, I uh, mostly moved the communication for everything uh, to MQTT because yeah, with that you're open to whatever platform you want to use, but uh, I never regretted switching to Home Assistant. Yeah, that's cool. Well, it, you you said you started out with like first logging temperature sensors and stuff like that without actually doing any automations, right? What was the yes. what was the purpose behind that? Just uh, again, because a lot of people that we talk to, like you said, they start off with like, "Hey, I want to turn on these lights or turn off these lights or do something like that," right? So, what was the intent behind logging everything first? Um. Yeah, we were living in a rental flat back then with with uh mm -hmm. which was right in the center of the city and um so in the summer it got very hot in the flat and outside on the streets as well and uh, what we wanted to do was um to, to spot the right time for opening the windows so that you don't mm -hmm. uh, get all the moisture into the flat but uh, you cool it down a little bit and um right for that i, I was logging um temperature inside temperature outside um temperature in different rooms and yeah <laughs> also cool. my, my wife she my wife she's a chemical engineer and uh, she loves looking at data uh, <laughs> that's so <laughs> cool and... <laughs> that's nothing wrong with that <laughs> that's awesome uh, okay so yeah i just looked up fhm i had never heard of it before so it's like some pearl server that can yeah, run on a same a raspberry exactly. pi yeah that's Cool. It, it, was, so, it was running on a Raspberry Pi 1 back then. Yeah. Um, wow. So the performance was not that bad, but um, yeah, when, when, when I saw that new uh, IKEA uh, integration in Home Assistant, I thought about a small, a short moment to, to integrate it into FHEM, and then I saw the Perl source code, and I've never written Perl before, but uh, with Python, I was a lot more familiar, and, and I thought, okay, maybe I could, yeah. Yeah, 
ch change the source code of Home Assistant for, for my purposes. I never did that because, um, yeah, development yeah, with Home too. Assistant, is, is, it's such a rapid pace. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, That's cool. flying, right? Um, so you've gone from FHAM to Home Assistant. You mentioned that you've got a few proprietary systems now. Which ones have you sort of running? You've got IKEA, Tradfree, I'm guessing. So you've got some Zigbee stuff. Yeah. Any other... Um, uh, actually, I've, I've not, I'm not using the IKEA stuff anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So I threw out the the, the thread free bridge. Um, no, I have to start in another way. Um, we, are, we we moved into our house in 2020. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, we built that house, so I was able to uh, adapt the electrical wiring uh, for nice. all of my uh, all of for all of my needs. Um, so I installed KNX. Um, in the whole house, I don't know if you if you know KNX. This is probably mostly European thing. But yeah, we've had another European on the podcast that yeah, went, yeah, we spoke very highly of it. So that, I was going to yeah, say, um, it must be a European thing, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, the downside is it's relatively relatively expensive, but mm. on the upside, um, it integrates very nicely with all the uh, switches and outlets and stuff like that. Um, the difference for KNX is that um, you don't run um, the wires from from the lamp right to the uh, right back to the switch, but you run it from there to the switching board in in the basement. Yeah. And in the basement, okay. you have these uh, DIN rail uh, actors that that switch the lights on and off, and they communicate with the switch uh, over a bus. Um, and this led to um, yeah to the situation that during const construction, um, I had already a pretty decent um, switching board in the basement and mm. had all the wires that were running into the uh, into the rooms but um, the walls were not yet plastered and, and everything was still under construction so um, I haven't had the, the uh, I didn't feel like uh, to, to install switches into the walls because I knew there would be uh, a lot of dirt coming mm, um, yeah. but then I took an older Raspberry Pi through Home Assistant on it put it uh, also uh, next to the switching board and was able to switch via Wi-Fi uh, some lights on and off in the construction site, um, which was pretty cool, cool because um, you don't have proper doors, you don't have proper switches on the wall, but you could um, already yeah. switch off lights. And because this was uh, in winter, it got dark very early in the, in the day. And so um, you needed light for, for doing stuff after work. That's, yeah, that's <laughs> This is my my KNX stuff. Um, the proprietary proprietary stuff that I'm using um, are mostly appliances. So my, my dishwasher, my stuff, uh, they all have Wi-Fi. The dryer, mm -hmm. um, they, uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, that, they have that's, their that's understandable. You're you're not building <laughs> your own dishwashers or anything, right? It's, <laughs> yet, yeah, <right>. yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, probably so won't. I hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's probably way cheaper just to buy one, even though they're not cheap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, what is sort of the the custom stuff that you mentioned that you you work on? Are you using yeah. ASP Home, or are you like just writing your own sort of hardware sort of stuff out, outside of ASP stuff? Yeah, both. Um, I've got uh, countless uh, ESP eighty two sixty six running in my home. Yeah. Um, at the time when, when I knew we were building a house, I was, uh, I designed some, some neat little PCB that, that has a, a temperature and humidity sensor and an ESP 8266. Um, and within the, the cabling for the KNX, um, I've also got, uh, 12 volts. So I, with just small and small, uh, ICs, I could plug these little boards into 12 volts mm. and I threw them yeah. in, in every room to, to just have yeah some device that takes temperature and humidity and and reports it via MQTT to my server or to to Home Assistant, um, and these temperature values are then taken by Home Assistant and uh, are mirrored onto the KNX bus so that the heating actuator for the underfloor heating um, also has their uh, input values. Um, yeah, this is. In yeah, that's that's cool. So, so like for for your because you said you did it at time like 
before your build um and as you kind of integrated it into the house there um i i've 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 always wondered this so if again the house i live in is you know pre-construction what or like like it's somebody else built it somebody else lived here before and i'm the second owner but if i was to build my own house where like like did you integrate it in the wall did you put it like a panel um how did you like how how was the design of it around like how, how does that vary as opposed to me taking 3d printing a case and like sticking it on a wall or something like that or is that what you did no that's that's not what i did um so you have to imagine um these knx switches are not very deep but you have the uh, retaining the, the holes in the wall where the cabling is and um yeah you put these these knx switches uh just click them into these these holes um right. and the pcbs that uh, i designed I just threw them behind the KNX switches and just cool. the small cable with the temperature and humidity sensor, I just slipped it at the side. So you just see some, some tiny, tiny, uh, I see that, that, uh, yeah, right beside yeah. the, uh, the switch and the rest is just hidden, uh, in, inside the wall. That's cool. So that's, okay. That's how I, uh, finally, yeah, made, made this, um, some that is cool. some one one or two years ago i um yeah i discovered uh the magic of esp home uh, and i'm using it very uh <laughs> very much since then because especially uh if you want to um want to code for an esp32 with uh with yeah. the arduino ide or with with eclipse or whatever um it gets it gets complicated very quick, very quickly, and it um, does. with ESP Home, this is so easy. And you just um, write some YAML code and click go, and then then it's running. And you don't have to yeah. worry about um, all these layout with the flash and bootloader, whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's it's fantastic. Do you use um, do you use the Bluetooth proxy at all, or the BLE proxy at all? Uh, that yeah. Feature? Um, <laughs> you. you <laughs> Uh, some some episodes ago, you you two uh, mocked about the Oral B uh, Bluetooth integration. We <laughs> <laughs> did, yeah, guilty. And that, that's exactly uh, the use case I have at home. Um, but um, here it gets interesting because um, I have a hot water circulation pipe. Um, I don't know if this needs explaining, but uh, I have a pump in the basement, and this pump can be switched yeah. off and on. Um, and while, uh, yeah, it's on for two minutes and then, uh, you just get hot water from the tap. And, um, I, um, yeah, the, the oral B integration is, um, tied to this, uh, to this pump by a home assistant. So when I start brushing my teeth, the pump gets switched on. And, uh, when I'm finished brushing my, brushing my teeth, then, um, I've got hot water from the tap right away and don't have to wait for, uh, Another ten liters for cold water of cold water. You know what? I'll give you that one. That's that's the first <laughs> productive automation. And again, there, there's fun automations and stuff like that, but it's the first productive one that I've heard with with the Oral B uh, integration. So kudos <laughs> to you on that one. That's uh, that's pretty good. Although Oral B has just made a lifetime customer out of you. There's no you I, can't I know, right? like, <laughs> yeah. Colgate. You've got no you no chance unless you've got a Bluetooth to- toothbrush out there. That's like, so true. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> uh, that's um. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's. So you've got the hot water in the the basement. So you and yeah. then it just obviously comes up straight away. Um, is there any other way that can trigger that hot water pump to be turned on around the house, like that you've done in a similar fashion? Um, yeah, more or less, uh, I started with some, some timing because before having kids, there was a fixed time when we got up in the morning. And so, uh, yeah, I knew when the alarm clock rings, then yeah, I just start the pump. Um, since we have, uh, kids, then yeah, this varies a little bit. So, um, I also have, as yeah, these KNX switches that are uh, inside the rooms. Um, they are momentary switches and they can be configured for whatever you like. So you've got like six switches and a display and uh, you can switch between different layers. And for the bathroom, one of these switches is, is reserved for starting this pump. So um, wow. yeah, when you okay. know you're just showering, then you go into the bathroom, 
flick the switch and uh, until you've unrest and hot water's there. Um, How does that go for nice. guests like needing to know? Like, I've never been in a house where I need to turn on a, a water pump. How do you explain <laughs> like to someone that's not? Oh, you need to push this button before you have a shower. Like, mm, I, I don't think that uh, guests would notice because um, if you don't press that button, then um, you just have to wait for one minute until the water's hot. Ah, so the circulation pump is just for for the pipe between between the hot water storage uh, and the bathroom, yeah. um, so that you don't have to wait for like a minute until the, the cold water from the pipe is uh, right. Yeah, dry. cool. Okay. You can save the water a little bit rather than letting it run and yeah, that makes sense. Doing whatever. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Didn't know that was a thing. Exactly. There you go. I guess yeah. Mm -hmm. In very cold winter climates, it might need to be a thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Um, cool. So, um, yeah, go on. Yeah, um, I was just then <laughs> wanted to talk about uh, my the, the 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 other appliances. So I've got the furnace and I've got some some um, yeah solar thermical hot water preparation thingy and a central ventilation system um, that all have their, their different communication buses that are sometimes proprietary, uh, but nevertheless well documented on the internet. Um, sometimes it's just, it's just a uh, mod bus. And mm -hmm. um, for, for all of these appliances, um, I built some, some ESP device that, uh, yeah, talks to these devices and um, gets me the, the interesting data. Um, so for the, uh, yeah, for the hot water and solar thermical hot water preparation system, um, I also use the, the value from the collector back that, uh, outside um, to determine um, when to uh, shut down the roller shutters because um, when there's enough sun outside in, in the summer, you don't want to heat up the house. And mm. um, right. I see that if the collector is uh, very up high with the temperature, um, there must be sun. And so I, uh, yeah close the, the the roller shutters is would you say home assistant is your brains for the house or do you uh, offload some of the stuff like i think before you mentioned that you've got your all the sensors around the house reporting back to knx for the like thermostat are you letting like the thermostat system do its thing or are you telling or is home assistant saying okay i think it's cold in the house now turn on right. the heater Mm, no, these these uh, thermostats um, just need an input temperature, mm -hmm. which is routed via Home Assistant. But uh, Home Assistant have nothing to do with switching on um, the pump or or opening the the circuit pipe circuit for yep. the underflow heating. Um, I'm a little bit um, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about doing this or or, or not doing this, um, but. If you've got these these brains, so it's just one Raspberry Pi uh, running in the basement, and um, if this is a little bit more, um, yeah, what's the correct word? <laughs> um, so if you've got these these brains a little bit uh, uh, spread out over the house, then um, yeah. if one thing breaks, the house is still working somehow, someone yes, yeah. one way or the yeah, other. Yeah. And that's also the reason why, uh, yeah, the roller shutters and, and the lights are all uh, switched directly via KNX. So I can switch them by a home assistant. This is also integrated, but um, if home assistant is not running, um, I can still switch on the lights or yeah, also you open, open right. shutters. Right, right. And then for your, even for your other stuff, like, again, like your appliances and stuff like that, like you said, are a lot of those, uh, plugged into home assistant or, or, or first of all, you said they're proprietary. So you're using smart appliances, not, not an appliance with like, a, like a sensors that you've attached to it or anything like that. So it's like, it's bought as a smart appliance. Exactly. Um, um do, do those come into a home assistant or are you doing anything? Like yeah. That? Um, so for, for all of these appliances, uh, there are integrations for Home Assistant that I am using. Um, for the dishwasher and the dryer, it's mostly just uh, yeah getting a message on my onto my cell phone because 
yeah. uh, the apps from the vendors are not that reliable, and uh, you always have to remember a special password for these uh, for these apps and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we, my wife and I, we are using Signal, and our house tells us, uh, okay, the um, yeah, the, the the vacuum robot is is finished, or uh, the dishwasher right. is finished, or whatever, and. Um, yeah, that's that's very that's neat cool. to, to have this all in one place and just not switch over ten different apps for uh, get notifications from ten different apps that yeah uh, maybe come at nighttime when you're still asleep and you forgot to uh, mute them or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, or um, you need to log into one of the ten apps like randomly every few months to keep the session active. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember the password. Yeah, that that happens and, all, especially with. I I realized that happens with my um, Nest uh, Fire Alarm or Smoke Alarm, mm. which is probably not the app I want to happen that to that to happen no. to because it's like you assume it's always logged in, right? So that yep. I can get an alert if something happens, but that's not the case. So yeah, yeah, gotta love it. In my experience, um, everything that's that's running over some cloud or the other will mm -hmm. eventually stop working. Um, <laughs> yep <laughs> one way or the other either the cloud gets shut down uh, you have examples every <laughs> two months <laughs> yep um, exactly or yeah. it locks out for some reason or uh, the vendor changes something in their API so that things are not working anymore and this is everything you yeah. don't have locally on your network um, might break and uh, or yep. is, is more prone <laughs> to break than uh, than if it's if just locally. So I'm trying to avoid cloud as much as I, I can, know. but yeah, with these with these appliances, it's it's not uh, feasible, Sometimes, yeah. honestly. It's unavoidable. <laughs> have to pick yeah. your, your battles there. The, the only uh, appliance that, that's not yet uh, directly communicating with Home Assistant is by washing machine, um, because it's mm -hmm. so old. Um, I've yeah. got the usual uh, plug that's measuring the power consumption. Yep. Um, but I haven't found a reliable rule to to determine whether the washing machine is already finished with this program or it's just uh, sitting there and uh, soaking soaking the stuff. Um, but in addition, uh, I had an old Raspberry Pi and a camera lying around, and uh, I applied the camera to uh, yeah to the top of the washing machine so the camera can can read the display of the washing machine, yep. which is integrated into Home Assistant. So whenever I open up Home Assistant, I uh, can as well see, okay, the washing machine still takes 10 minutes or whatever. That's cool. Um, I, I tried yeah. fiddling around with uh, detecting which digits, digits are lit, but uh, this uh, breaks as soon as uh, <laughs> the washing machine is, is moving fast. And, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. yeah, of course. So because because um, my wife and I are... With, Anyway, just read the time, and uh, I left it as a camera picture, and it's working fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Sometimes simple is good. Like an eight-bit display. Yeah. Maybe I should. Look. I think there's an integration in Home Assistant to read that. I don't know. It seems like I could just walk into the laundry and see right how long has it got left on it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, if it's like if it's like me and it's in your basement and you don't feel like walking downstairs. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Um, yeah, so exactly. one thing I do want to ask you about is um, in your original email, you said that you had connected your stove and vent to Home Assistant. Like, how have you, how have you automated that? Mm, yeah, uh, the stove does not do very much with Home Assistant, so I can send some. Uh, yeah, it's also this this Wi-Fi thingy. Uh, that's connected via the, the Siemens integration, but um, mm -hmm. you, yeah, what you can see in Home Assistant is if if you've set a timer for uh, one dish or whatever, um, you can see the the elapsed time in Home Assistant. But honestly, that's not very useful. The, the most use yeah. that you have is that you can switch on uh, the vent from the stove via Wi-Fi, but that's an that's integration cool. from the vendor. Um, for the vent. It's another way. It's another case because um, yeah, we have a wooden fireplace, and um, we are forced to have some some pressure governor 
that um yeah that that switches off the vent um if uh yeah there's not enough pressure from the chimney mm, so that okay. you don't get the 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 bad seal or whatever gases into your yep into your living right. room and um we also have some central ventilation system that's also connected there and um i uh yeah for not just cutting off the power to the uh to the vent i connected um yeah the notification from the pressure governor to um to the vent so that it gets switched off normally and not just cut the power because yeah i don't know if, if this uh yeah breaks something yeah yeah, yeah. interesting the other things i um so i told you that i have this uh, central heating system um yeah. This is also some some appliance that, which, with you can uh, talk to via Modbus, and um, I have some um, yeah just just two photovoltaic panels on my garage, and um, they are producing like six hundred watts. Um, and for the time in in spring and autumn, um, there is more electricity generated than than I could than I'm normally using in my house. And I thought about, yeah, last winter I thought about how to stop using as much gas as before because, yeah, you know, war in Ukraine and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so I uh, ordered some, um, yeah, some air heater that uh, was also plugged into the, the air duct uh, from the central ve ventilation. And um, I designed um, a PCB with a, with a dimmer, like, just for uh, incandescent bulbs, yep. um, yeah. With which I can, um, yeah, adjust the power that this uh, this air heater is using, um, and adjust the power uh, to a degree that fits the uh, the energy that that's uh, exported to the grid. Because I don't get any money for the the exporting, um, so, you may as well use so it. I don't, just don't want to give it away. And so I'm using this uh, extended energy. Right. Uh, to heat up my house a little bit, um, it's not working perfectly, and probably need to need to uh, design a second version of this PCB. But uh, for some days in in spring, it worked okay. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. So, like, like what happened? Like, why? Like, why? Like, is it something in the design, or is it something that's like environmental that's kind of causing it? No, it was uh, since it was first version of the PCB design, I got some problems with heat on the, uh, the semiconductors and stuff like that. Right, right, right. Okay. But, yeah. I'm guessing it doesn't um, work the reverse in summer where it can do cold air? No, since it's just a, mm. a giant resistor that's generating heat, it cannot <laughs> generate cold yeah. air. Yeah, that'd be, yeah. But the, um, the central ventilation system has a heat exchanger and mm -hmm. um, also has a, a bypass um, that can be switched on or off. And um, before having this automated into Home Assistant, uh, whenever we wanted to switch that bypass on and off, we needed to to go upstairs uh, to yeah fiddle around with this very tiny display of this appliance. And uh, yeah, after that, uh, we we had the chance to to automate this. And so in in summer when there's uh, yeah when when it's warmer outside than inside, then um, the bypass is on, so the, the heat exchange is working to, to keep the cold inside and the warm outside. And yep. uh, during night when the temperature is falling, at some point uh, the, the bypass uh, gets switched on so that the cold air from outside comes into the house. So this is one, one of these very, yeah, numerous um, automations that I'm using in Home Assistant. Um, yeah. Which make life a lot easier. Yeah, because then you don't have to think about it, right? Like, because you can tell, yeah, right, exactly. you don't have to look at the weather. Oh, is it colder outside now? Do I need to switch that off or on? Or, yeah, it's just yeah. It's done for you. What would you say is the coolest automation you've got in your house? Yeah. Like, your most favorite. Coolest... Yeah, if you wanted to. <laughs> 
the, the coolest automation is the one I already mentioned with the Oral B integration. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> you've already bragged about that one. You have to go your second one now. <laughs> That's <funny>. yeah, okay. <laughs> um, maybe um, so. I've got some some door sensors in on all the windows and and doors to the um to the garden, mm -hmm. and um during summer um when the sun sets, I normally close all all the, the shutters and um. When I detect that the door is open, then I won't close the shutter for the door to uh, into the garden, um, which also stops the shutter when the door is opened, um, because right. when you are in the garden and you see uh, the shutters going down, you can just sprint to the door and just push it open, and as soon as it's a little bit open, the shutter stops, which can get you inside if you've. If you, if you yeah, don't yeah. have your, your smartphone with you to open it up again. Yeah. <laughs> Which rarely <laughs> happens, but uh, you never know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lock yourself out. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> I'm also checking for the shutters, uh, for the doors to the garden, um, if my um, AV receiver is on. So whenever I'm sitting on the couch watching TV, um, I don't want the uh, the shutters to go down that early but uh, they can stay up until I go to bed or until it's really dark outside mm. um, and so if the AV receiver is on um, yeah home assistant is confident that I'm watching TV and so it stops uh, yeah closing them yeah um, and what I also do with that automation um, my subwoofer is uh, also connected to a switchable outlet which I can also switch on and off via KNX um, nice and whenever the AV receiver is on, um, it switches the subwoofer on and vice versa. So um... I had that exact automation back in the day before I moved to Sonos. I had a, a UV <laughs> seven speaker, two big subwoofers. And I was like, I don't want to have to keep turning those subwoofers off and on each time. Like, yeah. I need to automate this. Like, yeah, <laughs> I, I know exactly that automation. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a much better yeah. way. As, as a kid, I used to have to run and... You know, flip the switch on the subwoofer, yeah, yeah. and <laughs> that was my job, right? It's... <laughs> yeah, my, my subwoofer has a um, some standby mode, so it detects if there is a signal, and if there's no signal, it gets into standby. But um, the power supply, so m my wife insists telling me that uh, the power supply makes noise if the subwoofer is in standby. I don't mm. hear that noise. Maybe my ears are too bad, but um, <laughs> for for uh, yeah. <laughs> That so from from that perspective then so you turn on the TV that turns on every anything else that you got uh, going on in there because from from an yes. automation perspective in your studio or a studio in your like home theater <laughs> setup um not really so yeah the TV switches the AV receiver on via HDMI so there's no home mode, home assistant involved but um yeah. This is One of my cool. favorite Everything automations for my TV is because um, uh, our TV looks, uh, our living room is west facing. So as the sun's coming over to set in the afternoon, it can be really annoying. So if Home Assistant knows the TV is on, it will close the shade on one of the windows um, when the sun's at a certain angle. Um, yeah. Which sounds like the opposite of what you're like doing. You, you've got if the TV's on, don't don't control the blinds at all. Whereas I want yeah. the, you know as soon as the TV's on, I want the blind to close because otherwise I can't see the TV when the sun you know comes out from a cloud. Um, yeah, I just love like the way Home Assistant can interact with you know the TV being on, control the blinds, knows what the sun's doing. Yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I also have some some automations that um, depending on the time of the day. Uh, in summer, I close the blinds uh, on the side of the house where the sun is probably on, on that time of day. Yep. Um, yeah. The other nice. thing um, connected to, to brightness, um, maybe, um, my bathroom lights are dimmable. So I've got just this one KNX dimmer on there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, during nighttime, so this KNX stuff can, can also... Um, Determine if it's if it's night or day, if, depending on the signal that's on the bus, and the signal also gets gets sent from um, home assistant. And um, during nighttime, if I switch um, the bathroom lights on, they get on, they are switched on on the dimmest possible setting. So it's like 
half a percent of, of uh, maximum brightness. So yeah. that when you get up from the bed, get into the bathroom, switch the light on, you don't get, get blinded. And yeah. um, But since other rooms in the house don't have this, uh, yeah, don't, don't have dimmers, um, I have an automation that uh, if after a certain time the light gets switched on in the bathroom, um, every minute uh, dim it up for 1%. So then t during the time I'm in the bathroom, every minute it gets a little bit brighter and a little bit brighter. And once I'm right. finished with showering and stuff, um, it's as bright as it needs to be for not getting blinded for the, for the other lights. And yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's actually pretty smart. This one. Like, yeah. Especially if you're waking up, you know, before the sun's up and you need to go into another room. The last thing you want to do is go from like, yeah, a dark room yeah. into a bright room. It makes great sense. This yeah. is why I don't get up before the sun's up. Just... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I say that, but I have every time I end up flying, it's like super early morning and I have to get up at like 3 a.m. to go to the airport, which oh. is like an hour away. And like, yeah, it's just the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Um, do you use um, like, like from a, from a controlling the whole home automation piece, like what's your, what's, not not just yours, your family's preferred way of doing it, right? Like phone, tablet, voice, all of it, none of it. I'm not yet using voice. Um, I'm, uh, I find the, the, the new uh, development in Home Assistant very interesting. And uh, if mm -hmm. they were available, I would have already bought this M5 stack board that you mentioned on your last episode. But <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> they yeah. are not available. Um, since I already told you everything cloud connected will eventually break, I don't, um, for that reason, I don't have a Google home or uh, Amazon Alexa. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also, I don't want my two year old daughter to, to <laughs> cry to Alexa to do something crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, with this Canic stuff and this, uh, very multifunctional buttons that you have everywhere that, that can be, um, yeah, the functionality of these buttons can be changed uh, to whatever you like right. by just, yeah, changing the configuration. Um, we are mostly, uh, yeah, using these buttons and uh, by a degree using our smartphones. But I have a tablet uh, hanging in the living room, but I'm mostly using it for reading newspaper, but not <laughs> for... Uh, <laughs> yeah, switching things in Home yeah. Assistant. Uh, and this works pretty well. The, the rest cool. is just automated. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Home. So just buttons to get around it or to... Yeah. In addition to whatever you have. Yeah. How That's often good. would you say you need to update the buttons around the house on the on the KNX side? Like you configuring them, you know, like you're changing them often or... Are they pretty much set not, and you've just left them as they are? Not really. Um, not really that often. Roughly whenever something changes in the house. So and the first time when, when we moved in here, uh, we changed them like every two or three weeks. But yep. after, after six weeks or so, uh, they were all doing the stuff that we were anticipating that they do. And then after that, uh, I didn't change them. Um, the point is you have two, two uh, means of configuring these buttons. So you could either um, connect them right in KNX with the actors so that they do stuff directly over KNX without involvement of Home Assistant. Or you can just uh, define them as a general button that gets uh, yeah, analyzed by Home Assistant and mm -hmm. then you can do stuff in Home Assistant. and. Um, Reconfiguring them via Home Assistant is a lot easier than doing this via Canix because for Canix you need a special software that only runs under Windows and whatever. Uh, right, and um, yeah, right. doing this stuff via Home Assistant is a lot more flexible because then it's just yeah changing an automation in Home Assistant. Um, yeah. For my daughter's room, I've I've done just that. So there's um, the eight momentary switches um, for uh, for the blinds. So there are two windows. And you've got up and down, um, two are for the ceiling lights, which is, which are also dimmable. And so you have brightness yeah. up, brightness down. 
and the two remaining buttons are uh, I've got them integrated into Home Assistant. And um, when she was very small, um, during changing diapers, mm, we sometimes needed uh, warm or hot water. And yep. for on one of these switches, I, I connected it via Home Assistant with the uh, with the pump for the uh, yeah hot water circulation that I talked about. Um, yeah. And since it's directly beneath, uh, beside the table uh, where we change the diapers, um, it's just one click away, and then uh, you don't need to wait for hot water to uh, come. To just open the tap, and it's there. So this is one one thing. Um, other things that have got integrated uh, via Home Assistant. So in our sleeping room, um, we have an LED strip with WLED, which is also a very great project mm -hmm. and. Um, There's another rabbit hole you can get stuck into. Right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, with, with one switch, it's connected to Home Assistant, and Home Assistant switches this WLED strip on and off. So you don't have to uh, fiddle around first with the switch be beside the door for the ceiling light, and then again with your smartphone um, for this LED strip. So these. Yeah, no. these yeah mm. beside my uh my main door um i had two buttons that uh started the uh vacuum robots but yeah we don't use them anymore because um yeah <laughs> most most of the visitors also pressed these buttons and then wondered uh, <laughs> why the vacuum robot started and um if these <laughs> visitors were little children they were scared and so uh, i switched this off so yeah, <laughs> that's um, that's the best kind, right? Just start yeah. scaring the kids with the <laughs> robot chasing them, and okay. uh, but yeah, that's actually that's actually a cool idea because it's like one of the things I've been wanting to do is basically so so the vacuum robot's actually just beside me on the on the side of me here, but uh, doing like based on our presence, so I'm out, she's out, run it, but then I don't want it to do the whole like. Like I want to do it once a day or like once every couple of days kind of thing, right? Like we're not we're not that messy. <laughs> like where it's we need to clean up. Though, though I do I do actually like cleaning it every day, but uh, it's having a button. I think is nice because it's not like a every time you leave it it can go get enabled kind of thing, right? So mm -hmm. having a button is like a more manual. Like hey, go turn it on and then and then do that. And I thought of like okay, like you know, maybe send an actionable notification. Hey, you're both out of the house. Do you want to start the vacuum or something like that? But when I'm driving, it's not going to show up and I'm not going to be picking up my phone to be like, you know, sw swiping through as, as if you're on Android, as I'm it, driving, man. right. Or yeah. And, and you well, have to that's... reliably detect if you, if both of you are not at home. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I that hasn't been much of an issue. Like my, the accuracy is actually pretty good uh, with the, okay. with the home assistant com companion app. I'm we're both on iOS. So it's, uh, oh, okay. it's been, we haven't had a ton of issues with that, but yeah, it's been, it's been, it's one of those things where I think it's just, how do I efficiently do it? Right. And, and manual input might actually just be a good thing. Just have a little like button on the side, just press it and just fires off a trigger to say, Hey, go clean the house kind of thing. Right. So. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. The other thing, if I'm just talking about my front door, um, there are other things that I've got automated there. So my front door, um, has the option to, uh, be opened via an electrical contact. So you just, uh, yeah, wire a relay. And if these contacts are closed, then the, uh, yeah something in the door retracts and you can just push it open and um <laughs> i connected that to a, a esp um yeah esp 8266 device so from home assistant i could open i can open my front door um this is of no very good use because if you just have to uh, open the home assistant app and uh, search through all your lovelace <laughs> dashboards to <laughs> where's the door then <laughs> you're yeah very much quicker by by just using your key but um what i did then was i've got these uh, nfc tags um yes yeah and just uh yeah put them right beside the door and and connected them with an uh yeah event in home assistant um so that when 
if you are already uh, in our Wi-Fi and are connected to Home Assistant and then scan this this tag, the door will open. Um, and then just, you can tell uh, whose who's phone scanned it. So then you can say, all right, you know, Philip, you know, unlock the door at this time, all right? Like... Um, <laughs> honestly, no, I just have one uh, user <laughs> <laughs> on Home Assistant and fair, we're both fair. using it, so... Yeah. yeah, okay, that's... Yeah, admin, open this door at, you know, 2 a.m. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's interesting. Since yeah. uh, no, nobody else that than my wife and me has the password for Home Assistant, um, the ocean automations would not work. And, yeah, yeah. You need and that also device. Don't, you, you need that device and you need... Uh, to be in our Wi-Fi, and so I'm, <laughs> I think this this is uh, relatively safe. Yeah, I think I, so. I think there's a lot of people that will go, oh, you know, the door's connected to the Wi-Fi, that's it, you're going to get hacked. Well, yeah, I mean, but you know, like Rohan said this like a million times, someone's just going to put a brick through the glass in the door, right? As I was actually just going to say wifi. that. So. <laughs> that's your go-to. <laughs> I, I can tell you, like, oh, I've got something to say, I'm going to say that. Like, no, no, I'm going to get in there before you. <laughs> It's, yeah. but, but it's, it's so it's so true right like we we focus yeah. so much on this thing whereas you have a giant window on the door and you're done right like it's but. yeah yeah and if you ask the police uh, criminals are normally not very intelligent so no nah. Pro probably yeah. the attack vector is different than we anticipate um, yeah well it's it's you you do all of this complicated stuff right and and it's the simplest things that they can get through <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah it's it's always it's always lazy people that ha that find the most efficient way of doing things, and you know the least intelligent people that find you know the way of like the best way of, of breaking whatever <laughs> you've done. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, um, so I've done the same to my garage door, um, mm -hmm. which only gets to use when uh, yeah when you're coming from somewhere and need something out of the garage, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, if you just want to drive away with a the car, then uh, you will probably open the garage door before. But yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, so just on the, these door locks, um, the I'm guessing like so they're like magnetized or something with an electric stripe to let you in and out. What happens in the event of a power failure? Do the doors unlock? No, um, but... they only unlock if there is power. And if there is no power, they just behave like a normal door, and you can open it with a key, and nothing else. Right. Okay. So they they need gotcha. some some, okay. I don't know, twenty four volts or two thirty volts. I don't know. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. I also have my my um, my doorbell is also based on an ESP eighty two sixty six. Um, I've got some some DF player with a small SD card connected to it with a small speaker, that um. Yeah, just place one of out of three melodies that uh, are, yeah, nice. short melodies. And um, since it's an ESP8266, it also tells via MQTT that someone uh, rang the door. And I as well get um, a notification via signal to my smartphone. Yep. Um, right. That someone's at the door. No video camera or anything? I don't have any cameras. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I thought about installing cameras, but uh, I did not yet feel the need to to do this. Yeah, not such a bad neighborhood here. <laughs> um, but getting the notification to your phone is uh, especially neat if you are uh, way back in the garden or in the basement or wherever you don't hear mm -hmm. uh, the doorbell. And um, yeah, and the other thing that I've got automated on my front door is uh, the letterbox. Um, I have mm -hmm. one of these very tiny Zigbee door sensors in the letterbox. Mm -hmm. So one opens the lid, um, it gives me a notification, and um, also if one one of the the bulbs that are right beside the door uh, starts to to light up. And um, so when I get home and I have forgotten that there was a notification via signal that some something's in the mailbox, um, I still see see this this uh, light shining, and then I can just walk back out and take stuff out. Right, right, right. The only problem I have with that is, and I'm guessing like you, your mailbox might be like in the door, like physically for you. No, Mine's it's just, like... just a, 
It's just a, a metal box that's uh, bolted to the wall next to the door. Yeah. Okay. Mine is like a metal box, but it's not near the house. It's like at the front of the driveway, about you know, yeah. 20, 30 meters away. Um, I get no signal. I put a vibration sensor in there. It just goes unavailable straight away. It's so frustrating. And then yeah. Rohan's got an yeah. even more complicated mailbox set up. Yeah. It's down the street well, or something. Yeah, it's a community box, right? So it's... Yeah. it's uh, one giant box and there's like a bunch inside it right and that usually that's what canada post does even though it's like it's not like a house to house unless you're in like rural where like phil said it's in the front of your house or something like that but at least I, well i mean phil for your for yours if it's that far away i guess you could like again you're introducing another thing now but like you could use something like a laura wan base oh i know i trust about it i'm but, like but it's so overkill i don't need kilometers yeah. of range right like i can just yeah, see yeah. it right there no the, yeah. the the other option if you want to solder by yourself um there's this very very cheap uh 433 mega ads uh modules that that can just send or receive but not both um and you can buy like sender and receiver for i don't know 80 cents um, mm, and true. connecting them with an Arduino and uh, using this for, um, yeah, signalizing the, 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 the mailbox stuff to back to your home. Um, this could work. They have a, a impressive uh, range. Yeah, that's true. And Maybe I should look into the If you, if you stick to, to some, um, some standard protocol, I don't know if this exists, exists but... Um, I have a um, RTL SER DVB-T stick that is mm -hmm. um, that I'm using as an um, software-defined radio to um, mm -hmm. receive all these these signals because um, yeah I've got one cheap wireless temperature humidity sensor that's inside the the, the uh, in the garden and in the uh, what's it called called the house in the garden where you have all your plants and there are windows uh, all around. Oh, the greenhouse? Um, yeah, the greenhouse, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So to get to get the temperature from the greenhouse, um, have a sensor there and, and that's uh, received via this uh, RTL stick. And um, the interesting thing is one of my neighbors, I don't know which one, but one of my neighbors has a very fancy um, weather station, which uh, yeah nice. measures uh, like <laughs> <You pick up. laughs> winds wind speed wind direction uh yeah. illumination whatever and i can't pick that up because there's nothing encrypted or or yeah somehow paired or whatever um and i have these values also in my home assistant and they fit nicely to to the values i am already measuring um yeah and that's, I've got some that's more perfect you you don't have to spend like three hundred dollars for or, or, or a couple hundred euros for <laughs> just going through and getting a weather station for yourself. Just somebody else did the did the effort for you there, right? So, yeah, I think one of those sticks is in my future because I would I have a, a rainwater tank out in the the garden that I would like to know how much water is in there. And I've seen on AliExpress there are water like tank water tank level meters that you can get, um, and they. Um, broadcast on that frequency and i've seen the same github project that you've mentioned philip where um it has like a list of devices that can be used with that stick and it will know okay this protocol is you know transmitting this data and it can suck it straight into home assistant so maybe i'll just yeah. get a like a, a cheap open door window sensor on 433 megahertz as well that's compatible and use the one usb stick for it um, this nice. is also one of the rabbit holes that you can can dig into um, because this project supports like 170 protocols, yeah. different protocols, and it's, it's amazing. Um, the funny thing is that uh, you can also uh, receive tire pressure monitoring systems from cars driving by here. Wow, by that's your house. cool. And you know <laughs> oh. that uh, this Renault has like three bars of tire pressure on the back <laughs> left tire or whatever. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's... See that that would actually annoy me because then at that point now you start getting all of this extra like so with the BLE proxy, so for the oh, uh, yes, for the yes. for my for my shades I had to turn it to uh, active right so when yep. I did that I started getting all of these uh, presence sensors or, or uh, beacon eye beacons mm, right yep. and now I just have this list of them and I was like oh, ignore 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 until the next person walks by my house and now I'm just like, right, it's, yeah it's the same for me. <laughs> Yeah, you can't so turn like a just... whitelist on, like and just 
disable everything I, else? I think I think I can. I, I honestly haven't looked. I might I might see if I can go in and be like exclude eye beacons, right? Just because yeah. I, I don't care. Uh, and I'm sure it's picking up a bunch from my house too, right? Just internally, like with because I remember like when I stuff. first started with Home Assistant, like I would use the Bluetooth um, LE for presents, and there was the same issue, right? Like in an apartment complex, everyone would come over, right? I get like random MacBooks, um, iPhones, you name it, right? Like an, uh, someone would turn yeah, the headphones yeah. on, bam, there's an entity in Home Assistant. Um, but I think there was a setting back in the very, you know, like the zero point six seven days of being able to have like an allow list and a block list right um so maybe that's something they've still got that you could flick on i hope they do because otherwise yeah, yeah i'm yeah i just right now i just ignore it and don't really bring it into anything but yeah well this 4 th 433 megahertz thingy um i used a more brutal approach um since this this tool um gives its data via MQTT. Um, mm -hmm. I just by hand define the topics that I'm interested in, which are the sensors that I already know of. And the rest is uh, published to the MQTT broker, but then vanishes from there. So I don't get that yeah. these tire pressure monitoring stuff into my home assistant. Um, but if you are uh, using this, there is an um, custom integration. No, um, the other thing. Um, that uh, add add-on. There are add-ons, two add-ons for for this RTL four three three, and one add-on just adds every sensor it receives it as an entity into Home Assistant. And I by accident I had this this add-on activated at in my dad's instance, and at one point in time he told me my Home Assistant is so slow and so sluggish, yeah. and can you do th something about it? And uh, I looked at it. Edit and it there was like five hundred different entities from this RTL four three three integration add on, and um, I then tried to uh, delete them by hand, which was not working very well. And then I dug deep into the uh, internal config files of Home Assistant, uh, changed them, rolled them back to his instance, and uh, from this time on, I deactivated that automatic adding, and. Um, from then on, it ran reasonably well, reasonably well. So, both. Are you doing anything with my... your dad's instance and your instance like communicating to each other, or are they complete different silos? They don't know of each other. Um, the home assistant instances don't know of each other. Um, mm -hmm. I've got our networks connected so that I can uh, log into his home assistant. Um, if yep. he has some problems, or I do this periodically to uh, trigger updates, but uh, they are just completely separate from each other. Yep, um, makes sense. He has a whole lot different integrations, which are mostly also working great, and he's very, very pleased with the result because he also doesn't have to open like 10 different apps for uh, switching the light off uh, yeah. and That's shutting it. down the blinds and whatever. Yeah. One one thing I can talk about is some some toy for my daughter that I built. Um an activity board, which is just I don't know if this term is common in English or if it's just a German <laughs> Anglicism, but it's just a, a board, a wooden board where uh where there is some stuff that um the kids can, can play with, like some pseudo plugs or oh, yeah. like mine has some gears and switches that they that she can press. And um, since just having switches to press without them doing something is uh, a little bit boring, um, I also added um, an ESP32 and um, an LED strip with uh, WS2812 NeoPixel LEDs. Yeah. And um, from these switches, she can either turn on the LEDs that are in there, but since um, I'm running ESP Home on, um, on that ESP32, um, it was also easy for me to just connect it to, to anything else at Home Assistant. So two of these switches um, are switching on parts of the, the ceiling lights. And when she discovered this, she was very, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And every uh, every other kid that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, that gets visiting us, uh, they, they also like to press the 
especially the buttons that switch on and off the ceiling lights. That's cool. That's funny. Uh, is it all wireless or is it plugged in? Like, so is it battery operated? Mm, so the, the ESP32 is wireless, but yep. uh, the wooden board is bolted to the wall. Okay. And uh, so I've got an outlet off uh, be behind the board and uh, yeah, just yeah. some power supply to switch down to five volts. Nice. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, yeah, I've got this usual on-air light uh, right outside of my door here, which, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, since I'm running Linux as well on my private computer as well as on my uh, working computer, um, I have just a cron job that's uh, querying if um, the webcam is in use. And if the webcam is in use, uh, it switches the light on. Um, so it doesn't switch the light on directly, but it just uh, publishes some MQTT topic that uh, resembles webcam in use or not. And yep. if webcam is in use, then I've got the automation home assistant to switch the light on and off. Um, and so that can tell the family, you're in a meeting, don't bother me. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. that's cool. So it's not that bad if it just have uh, my headset on and just just talking to a person, but yep. uh, if I've got the camera on, then it's probably some more official meeting and then I don't really want my daughter to come and tell me that, uh, yeah, she's home. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And I guess it's also good for, um, like, I guess you see, well, especially working from home now, you know, people will be on a meeting yep. in the living room or something, people just behind, you know, walking around, you're like, oh, you know, wouldn't be, like, maybe they need a bit of a heads up that they're also on camera, right? Um, so that's, yeah, a good idea too. Yeah. The other things that, that I uh, also connected into Home Assistant are uh, my electricity meter and my gas meter. Mm. So electricity was easy because with these smart meters that have uh, an optical uh, connection where, where you can just put a, a photodiode in with an ESP8266 and then it spits out uh, power for all three phases, voltage for nice. all three phases and uh, the amount of energy that's been used since the last values were transmitted and yeah. um, this was very easy and uh yeah it was very cool to see how your electricity demand over the day changes mm -hmm. um the gas meter was a little bit more tricky because it just had some some um metal pin that's Probe rotating and oh, yeah, um, the same thing there are yeah. these 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 proximity sensors for metal that uh, you can i've got some some 3d pin printed fixture that holds these metal sensors right before this uh, this pin, and um, every every time it comes by, I know there is like one hundredth of a, a cubic meter of gas has been used, and hmm. yeah, this can be uh, transferred into uh, kilowatt hours via fixed factor, but yeah. That's yeah, because I think Home system Assistant's then. added gas now to the energy dashboard from memory, so yeah, yeah. you can all you can see it all yeah. in there. Um, I would love to do that. I think the only problem I have with that is I don't have power near my gas meter. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and then it's out in the right. Like I said, I need to make something weatherproof that can hold house battery for it. Yeah, just be annoying. Okay, my my gas meter is uh, in the basement, right next to uh, the furnace. So, nice. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> That's convenient. This was easy. Yeah, very easy. Ours are all outside and and I don't actually know if I have a proper meter or if it's just like a little like tap thing that they that they pull from, but I don't mm. I've seen I've seen I've seen meters, but I think those are more commercial. I need to look. But I might be wrong. But but it's definitely outside for me, right? So same same yeah. deal with Phil like where it's like I don't have an outlet anywhere remotely. It's on the other side of the house, like all of, all of my, like if I have any outlets and stuff, they're all on this side of the house, not on the others. Yeah. So, but <laughs> it's always the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, I tried to, uh, to read out my, uh, my water meter, but this miserably failed. Um, there is this, uh, <laughs> this project where you have, an uh, AI model running on an ESP 80, uh, ESP 32 with a, with a camera. But uh, I didn't get it to read anything reasonable, so uh, mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I just abandoned that. Maybe if I've got time, uh, I will come back to this. But uh, 
at the moment it's just sitting there and doing nothing and I have to take the ESP off when I need to read out the amount of water that we used <laughs> for one year. So this is not working. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. I think I have not yet completely talked about my garage door because um, so I've got a, a motor that, that can open the garage door and mm -hmm. close it. Um, and since this motor has some has only some proprietary connectors, uh, I just connected an, an ESP eighty two sixty six with relays to the uh, to the connector where you can just yeah put a switch on too. Yeah. Um, and from there on, I just can I, I can open and close it, but I've got no idea if the door is open or closed. And um, when we one time came back and the garage door was open and we were wondering how long it was open already um, since we were away for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. um, I thought, okay, I have to somehow detect if the garage is open or not. And um, I then uh, put a ESP8266 with these ultrasound uh, distance sensors um, to the garage door and um, when it gets up, so I'm, I'm reading out the distance to the to the floor, yep. and if the distance increases, then um, yeah, the percentage of open increases, and for the rest, since it's uh, running in a curve and it's then lying flat, um, I could not reliably determine the distance anymore, and then I added a uh, three-axis accelerometer, so when I see uh, the ESP is tilted like 90 degrees and uh, then I know, okay, the door must be in the uppermost position and then it's 100% open. Um, so it doesn't matter if the uh, measurement from the uh, ultrasound sensor isn't that reliable because I know it's open or I'm relatively convinced that it's closed. But um, the in-between is just fancy to have a nice 0 to 100% curve. But Yeah, um, I did. Like yeah. I've got a roller door on my garage and... I, instead of doing ESP Home, I just went. I think I got a Miros Home Kit uh, mm -hmm. garage kit. Right, it does the same thing. It I, I tells the garage door to open and close with the relays, um, and then I think it actually comes with a read um, sensor. So you just attach two magnets, yeah. one on the door itself and uh, somewhere on the house. And yeah, now I can tell um, right. if the house is open. And because it's Home Kit, it's local, um, so it's all Wi-Fi based. Yeah. Don't need to worry about cloud or anything. It's connected to the Miros app, which I need to just block um, if I can. But um, yeah, I think HomeKit make, makes it local. Yeah. So just up, down, basically based on where the you, you have two sensors, one up, one down, and to say not even not even, or it, I guess just it, down. It's either down yeah. or it's not. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't need. I don't. It doesn't tell me a percent. It's open fifty percent or one hundred percent. It just yeah. it's open or closed, and I don't need that level, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I had no real uh, point to to fix the the fixed part of that read sensor. Yeah. So there's these um, metal framing, but uh, they are needed, and and the wall is a little bit retracted, so I've got no no position to uh, yeah to mount the fixed part. Makes sense. And that's why I used this more complicated approach. <laughs> nice. <laughs> cool. Well, Philip, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today um we will leave uh yeah any links to stuff that we've talked about um like the knx stuff i'll try and leave some links up to those integrations on our show notes but yeah thank you very much for talking with us today no problem thank you all thanks awesome. so much as well cheers cheers